Hi, I'm Bob Barton, Inspector General for the State of California. My agency's role in government is to oversee and provide transparency for the California Department of Corrections. There are 35 prisons in the state of California, with over 135,000 inmates, as well as several juvenile justice facilities and all of the parole offices that we monitor. We do this by monitoring a number of programs, including things like medical care, internal affairs, as well as an intake of complaints from staff and inmates. That's just some of what we monitor within the department. One of the areas that I think needs our focus right now more than ever is rehabilitation. And my staff is dedicated, and we have several ways of monitoring the department's programs for rehabilitation within our prison system. For many years, the prison system has been a revolving door. Recidivism is high, over 60% of our inmates come back to prison. This is something that we have to change if we're to be successful in the future. I'm proud of the work that my staff does in making sure that the programming we're providing and the rehabilitative opportunities that the department is providing on a daily basis are ones that will work and will take our society in the future where it needs to be. Warehousing these inmates and simply releasing them back into our communities is a tragedy for all of us and a cycle that we have to end. So I'm very proud of the work that my agency does. I'm proud of my staff. And we're excited about where we're going to be able to help the department grow in these areas. Because in the future, I can envision a society where those that do make mistakes, those that do go to prison, are able to be restored. I believe that there's the possibility for redemption in everyone. I believe that everyone who's made a mistake in their lives is not necessarily someone we should throw away, basically locking them up and throwing away the key. For too long, we've seen that that's been a failure. We need to do something different, and it's a responsibility for all of us, and I'm proud to lead an agency that has a big part in that. Hi, I am Chuck Rufo. I work as a Senior Deputy Inspector General within the OIG. I find my position as a supervisor within the OIG rewarding because each day brings new opportunities to grow in my job. I am encouraged as a civil servant to come up with new and better ways to improve each work function. This emphasis on improvement allows me and my staff to continually develop and grow. I believe it is possible to improve the focus on rehabilitation programs with our shared efforts by recommending objective and practical solutions through our monitoring and reporting. I think the work we do at the OIG is important because through our oversight, we have the ability to assist the CDCR become a model for inmate rehabilitation. The OIG is committed to helping by identifying where CDCR has demonstrated progress and whether measurable benchmarks for inmates served in rehabilitative programs were achieved. And our office and staff are engaged and inspired by fostering a cooperative and collaborative work environment focused on our agency's mission. What I love about the OIG is it fosters a can-do attitude in a workplace where motivated individuals who enjoy teamwork are valued. I'm Misty Palasic. As the Publications Manager for the Office of the Inspector General, I coordinate the publication of all the agency's reports. I also have the privilege of serving as the Executive Director for the California Rehabilitation Oversight Board. Part of my work on the board requires reviewing the rehabilitative programs throughout all California prisons. Rehabilitation, to me, represents renewed hope through a second chance at life choices. The opportunity to meet with administrators, educators, inmates, and volunteers provides a chance at a unique glimpse at the many components of rehabilitation from inside the institution and a chance to hear firsthand how programs are working. I also have the opportunity to be part of the solution in identifying creative programming opportunities, evaluating potential gaps in rehabilitative services, and recommending best practices. Inmates are released every day throughout California communities. Successful reintegration improves the quality of life for the entire community. 
Hi, my name is Gianna Bocalone and I work for the Office of the Inspector General. I work as a rehabilitation analyst, which basically means that I travel throughout the state visiting prisons and evaluating rehabilitation programs. I love my work because it gives me a unique perspective on, a, on an important social issue. Uh, because although we oversee the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, the issues we're dealing with are much larger than that. We're dealing with one of the larger social issues, I think, of our time. I've had the incredible privilege of witnessing men of all ages graduating from high school, earning diplomas and certificates that will help them when they help them support their families when they integrate back into their communities. I've witnessed mothers being reunited with their children. Um, I have seen some of the most hardworking and dedicated educators, correctional officers, correctional counselors, lieutenants, all working to help improve the lives of these men and women. I have seen women training service dogs to go out and help people back in the community. I could literally go on for hours about some of the most wonderful and inspiring things I've seen. So although the OIG acts as the eyes and the ears of the taxpayer, which is a huge honor, the fact that we do it with heart and soul is what makes coming to work a true honor and privilege. Again, the mission of the Office of the Inspector General is to safeguard the integrity of the state's correctional system by providing oversight and transparency through monitoring, reporting, and recommending improvements on policy and practices of the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, otherwise known as the CDCR. And now a perspective from the former Undersecretary of CDCR on the role and impact of OIG oversight. My view on the Inspector General's office and general view of oversight agencies is probably a little bit different than most folks. Let's face it, nobody likes somebody looking over their shoulder uh, and grading their work or telling them what they should and shouldn't be doing. But every now and then you come across the right formula for oversight and the right individuals who provide oversight. That they are practical and that they are solutions oriented. The bottom line is folks are trying to make findings, they're trying to make recommendations, they're trying to help you improve your operations. You don't always have to agree with all of those things, but maybe you partially agree or you completely disagree. If your mission is to provide public service uh, and government services in the best way that you possibly can, uh, you should have absolutely no fear about audits or oversight uh, and findings. I don't think anybody should be measured by the findings that are made. Maybe the better measurement of how we are in terms of how we perform our jobs and the leaders we are uh, is what we actually do about those findings. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all put our hands together and welcome Robert Barton, Inspector General, Office of the Inspector General. Good afternoon. I want to thank everyone, first of all, for opening your eyes, waking up after lunch. And uh, I was told when I was asked to speak if I would prefer an afternoon slot. I think Becca was just being kind when she said I would be able to invigorate the audience. What she really meant is I'm just a loud mouth. So um, hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy this presentation. But you've already had a teaser this morning. And I want to thank APSIA and I want to thank uh, the USC Price uh, School in, in giving us this opportunity as a group. Um, when I was given the opportunity as an agency and told we're talking about innovative leadership, look at what your department does and tell us where you think you'll have a big impact going forward. It was fairly easy for me, even though we monitor several programs within the department, to pick out rehabilitation. And you heard from Martin this morning that obviously our prisons were in a huge crisis in terms of overcrowding. And we've now got more space that's made it more possible to have realistic programming and rehabilitation. At the end of the day, though, when I decided to focus and impact on that particular category of what we monitor, I started to feel a little bit um, overwhelmed because the problem can be overwhelming. But to quote Martin Luther King, I often say people are surprised to learn that I'm an optimist when it comes to this. He spoke about it in terms of the civil rights uh, issues that he was dealing with, of course, and I talk about it in the crisis that we have in our country of over-incarceration. And it's easy to be cynical when you've had my particular career path. I started out as a police officer, then I was a prosecutor, put a lot of people in prison, came to the Inspector General's office, have been working with um, prisons and trying to better our criminal justice system, our prison system, and yet at the end of the day, what it's really going to take to be successful is meaningful rehabilitation. And to me, when I started thinking about that, 
What does that require? And two words came to mind for me, and that was redemption and hope. Because I think you have to have both of those. But first, you have to believe that redemption is possible. And sometimes it's easy to say it's not. Sometimes it's easy to say, well, you know, there's just no hope for these folks. And yet, when I looked at some of the definitions of redemption, it started to restore my hope. Redemption is the recovery of something mortgaged. And in the criminal justice system, we're talking about actual lives, actual people who have now been locked up, possibly for the rest of their lives. We're talking about salvation from an undesirable state, another definition for redemption. We would all agree that being in prison is one of the ultimates in terms of failure, being incarcerated, being hopeless. And finally, payment of an obligation. I would be the first one to tell you that there have to be consequences for crime. I mean, I think we would all agree with that, that there have to be consequences. And a definition that says redemption requires payment of an obligation resonates, I think, with those of us that understand what the true purpose of the criminal justice system is. Because at the end of the day, if all it is is warehousing people, then we've already seen that that's going to fail. There has to be a debt paid to the victims and society, both in and out of custody. Probably the most succinct way I heard this phrased was a person who had served life. He had committed a drive-by shooting when he was 19 in the Oakland area. And he was a gang member. He shot a rival gang member. He went to prison. He was serving 27 years. About two years ago, he was given a parole date, went to the parole board, and he told them, I'm a different person. I've been through many programs within CDCR, but finally it was my own self-triggering mechanism and insight into what I had done and the impact I had been and that I'm now a different person. I mean, which of us is the same 30 years later? And so this gentleman told the parole board, I'm going to be paying for what I did my entire life. The only choice you have is whether I'm going to pay in custody or you're going to let me pay out of custody. And he's now running a program to help young men in Oakland stay out and get out of gangs. So he's been successfully paroled. The other thing that I think we have to keep in mind is that the system that we currently have looks like this. We need to renew the system, sending less people in and allowing more people to come out. That's the only way we're ever going to turn it around because it is a problem. We have over 2 million people incarcerated in the United States. Two, over 200,000 of those are women. Over 61,000 are juveniles. In California alone, we have 136,000 wards of the state, state inmates. That's not even counting all of the people locked up locally in our jails. Those are huge numbers, and each one of those represents a life. We house them in 35 prisons in California, 42 fire camps, seven correctional facilities. We still have four out-of-state prisons and three juvenile justice facilities. What a monstrosity to lock people up. Look at the cost, $9 billion a year, about $50,000 per inmate. The numbers that Martin was talking about this morning, when he said 95% of them are going to get out, this is the other 5%. So we have about 4,800 serving life without parole and about 730 on death row. And they will never get out because of what they did or how they did it regardless of any personal redemption process they may have, but that leaves 95%, the rest of that 130,000, that will someday be coming out of prison. So if they come out and there's no hope, that other word that I was talking about, then where does that leave us? We've got to have hope, and the definitions that I looked at for this Again, fit the context, confidence in the fulfillment of expectations. That means the individual first has to seek redemption for themselves. We can throw all the programs we want at inmates, but until they decide within themselves that they're going to change, those programs are wasted. So it's finding the programs that are the trigger for that individual. Hope is the anticipation of promises unseen. And what I mean by that is we have to give them meaningful opportunities for rehabilitation. We just can't say we're going to do that. And finally, belief in the realization of potential. And that is when they are released, allowing them to successfully reintegrate and making a way for that to happen so that they don't come back in that revolving door cycle. Redemption is possible. I think we can stop this cycle. I think it's possible. 
But I think it requires hope and it requires action and it requires commitment on the part of all of those that are involved in this system. But I do have that hope because redemption is possible and I've seen it myself. I visit all the prisons in the state. I believe redemption is possible when I see a family's pride when the first person in their family gets a college degree while in prison. Redemption is possible when I see strong leaders within CDCR who believe in what they're doing in rehabilitation and making programs that will work. I believe redemption is possible when we have the voices of the public out there that understand we don't have to try to solve drug addiction by locking people up. I believe redemption is possible when we have elected officials who seek alternative justice systems for our veterans, for our homeless, for our mentally ill. I believe redemption is possible when those conservatives in which I would place myself realize that being smart on crime is not being soft on crime. I believe redemption is possible when you have community members like a teacher and his wife that start a program for children of incarcerated parents on their own, totally unfunded, to reach out and give an outlet for these young men and women in the Venice High School to do a creative writing project so that they can break the cycle, so that they don't follow in the footsteps of their parents, so that they can have a place to share that stigma that they've kept to themselves. There are 2.7 million children in the United States with a parent incarcerated. I believe redemption is possible when you give an offender a skill and all of a sudden they're creating masonry masterpieces when they've been told their whole life they have no talent. I believe redemption is possible when you give these female offenders a program where they're working and training service dogs for autistic people and for the first time may be experiencing the unconditional love that they're both giving and receiving. I believe redemption is possible when you have passion of educators and I've seen them beaming with pride when an inmate who came to them illiterate is now achieving their GED. I believe redemption is possible when you have volunteer communities, again, on their own, like get on the bus, that raise the resources to bring children to see parents that's a huge rehabilitative supportive system that's lacking in our prisons. And these people that have organized that program have done so outside of the department. And it's because they believe rehabilitation is possible. I believe rehabilitation is possible when you have inmates who are in programs that emphasize restorative justice and a way of understanding the impact that they have on their victims and working towards the healing of trauma. I believe redemption is possible when I go to a juvenile justice facility and a young man comes up to me and shows me not one, but three certificates he's received in computer skills and now he's tutoring other wards. I believe redemption is possible when we have programs where for the first time, once someone is paroled, they've been given a chance. They've been given a skill, perhaps in from the PIA, from the prison industries authorities, that they can turn into a realistic job where for the first time maybe they've got a paycheck and are providing for their family. I believe redemption is possible when you have staff members who understand the importance of programming, not only to keep themselves safe, but to redeem lives of the people that they're interacting with every day. I believe redemption is possible when we have wardens that are so progressive that they actually compete now with one another to see who can offer the more opportunities and the more successful programs than one another. I believe rehabilitation is, pro is, is possible when you have a programming phenomena where an entire yard of inmates, maybe 600, go to the administration and say, we, our entire yard, want to become an enhanced program facility because we all want to program. I believe redemption is possible when I personally saw firefighting crews made up of inmates coming down after having saved a community's homes and community members stopping, getting out of the car and giving them a standing ovation. I started with a quote from Martin Luther King and I want to finish with one as well. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. I believe redemption is possible. I hope you do too.